Andy Johnson, welcome back to the Bag Drop Podcast. Hey, hold on, hold on a second. Let me just change the mic. This is going to sound better, right? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. Good. I, I if I'm if I've got this, I literally didn't have to move. So it's uh, it's, if I have this thing in front of me, I might as well use it. All right. My world is already blown because last time you and I did one of these, well, I don't think it was, I think it was in person first off, uh, hanging out at Ravenslow Country Club, but, um, you're like an expert in, in tech. Now you guys give yourselves a hard time on the podcast all the time. Your sound quality is fantastic. You got all these different mics and setups. You're, you're a pro you're a big J. I don't know. I I I, I don't think I'm a, I'm a pro in any means. I, I think I'm just a, an idiot that's done done the task enough that i i have a rudimentary understanding there are uh there are millions of people that are better uh with the technical aspects of uh of of a podcast than i am but you know by virtue of uh of need and uh you know that i've i've become a, a, a below average a mediocre um technician uh, well you, you've logged some hours for sure i know i've had you in my ear for a good you know, eight to 10 a week sometimes. Um, what, uh, I, I said this before we got started, but no, no training, like how, your stamina, how's your podcast stamina? I, I sent you this invite. I was like, what's another hour for Andy of jumping on a pod? You know, I was lucky early with the fried egg. Um, the way we would do the yoke with dokes is that we would do like four hour recordings, like where with like a short break in the middle. And we would just like batch up a bunch of them and then slow, slow drip release them. And that, that really, um, got me in like marathon form early, but, but yeah, it, it's, um, I, this is the stuff that I like doing. I love talking about golf. I love writing about golf. I love playing golf. I, um, so that's the stuff that's fun that kind of, I think I always think about, um, you know, it, as you know, it becomes work, right? Like everybody has this, like, it, it, I got to do what I love. It doesn't really feel like work, but it is work. Um, and that's something like, you know, you, initially when you start and when you, when you take a job, it doesn't feel like work, but at some point it will feel like work. And, and the stuff that doesn't feel like work to me is the talking about golf, playing, like going and seeing new courses, uh, filming courses um, and writing about it. Like that's the stuff that fills up the tank. And it's the other stuff like, you know, running a business that that is the stuff that kind of uh, takes away uh, and, and depletes me a little bit, if that makes sense. It does. When, I, when we uh, sat at Pete's Coffee back in River North many years ago, Andy, I, I remember envisioning our businesses. Uh, we didn't talk about expense reports. We didn't talk about other things. There was mostly, uh, you know, drone. <laughs> you were talking about the drone game and uh, I was dreaming about Scottish uh, clubs. But uh, but no, the business side is, have you enjoyed, one thing I want to ask you about is just the growth of the fried egg, man. It's It's a bit surreal. I mean, I'm obviously a diehard fan of you guys and have been since uh, the early days. And I'm sure so many of our members and listeners are, but um, you have a team now you employ people like it, how's the team aspect of it. Do you enjoy that, that portion of like hiring people and, and, you know, bringing on uh, them to do more tasks? Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's one of the most fulfilling things about it is um, is getting to work with like people you really respect people who are very talented and uh, people that take something that you would do. I think the, the, the thing that I, I can say confidently is that, you know, uh, people, can, I, you know, I can come up with ideas. They come up with ideas, but I have people that are far more talented than me around me that take a lot of things that I do, a lot of things that we do, a lot of things they do, they make them so much better. Um, you know, Will Will Knights runs our events. He does an awesome job. He's so much, I think my lack of organization drives him insane on a daily basis because he is a very organized human being. You know, Cameron Hurtis takes our, our video content and, and, uh, and makes it, you know, just he's really brought it to life this year. Um, especially, and then, uh, Garrett Morrison, obviously on the audio side and, and as well as the right the writing side, like, you know, I can't tell you, um, my wife used to do editing, uh, for, for us and she doesn't know anything about golf. So, 
like the amount of care and attention that I would I would put into a draft is significantly higher than Garrett Garrett gets and Garrett and Brendan now get like literally like they sometimes are like you just you you stopped writing in this paragraph like I don't know where you were going but it just ended and uh, you picked up somewhere else so they get a significantly worse draft than uh, than I uh, Meg Atkins she keeps everything going uh, she she's like. She kind of is the utility knife. She anything that we we need, um, done. She she so it 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 really has been a team effort. Uh, and I think um you know that's the neat thing about growing is like going is seeing stuff tangibly improve. Um, is is really really fun. And then ideas that like you thought you know you might have thought in your head what it could be and then when you have people that can turn them into be turn them into something that you never b- foresaw them being is is a really neat thing and i'm sure you feel kind of the same way yeah you know i i i, I do yeah i think it's uh uh you 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 get back to the idea of like we both grew up playing sports and the collaboration and having teammates you miss out for for so long you have a vision and you want to kind of do it yourself and have it a certain way, but we, our team, we mostly get by with like part-time contractors at new club and people chipping in here and there. But even in those scenarios, we're spending time and collaborating with each other. And, and I love that. Like I'll have a vision. I'll, I'll throw something out and it, someone will just suggest something that takes me a totally different route. And, and I, and so that's the part that I've enjoyed the whole HR thing and, and having, you know, payroll and expense reports, that part, not so much. I'm struggling with that as I I'm sure you do sometimes, but um, it is fun. It is fun having a team. Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, it's, it's one of the most rewarding things and especially, especially when they get to do cool stuff too. That's, those are my favorite moments. It's like when you can tell that they are loving what they're doing and uh, you know, and, and, and you know, I I sympathize because they all have to deal with me on a regular basis, which is not, not an easy thing to do. Oh well, when you when you brought, I mean, and, and you listed a lot of people that uh, pro- before the Friday, I was fans of whether it be Twitter or whatever, and so I just know that you're building such a, a strong crew of of really um, golf minds and, and people that get shit done. But when you landed Northeast Ohio's native son, when you brought Mr. Porath on the show, I mean, that was. That's like Deshaun Watson without any of the legalities. The no baggage. issues. You got nothing. You got the perfect fit, man. You're going to be Super Bowl chance with that guy. Yeah, yeah. He's he's obviously great. He's He's got – I mean, I think the thing that amazes me the most about Brendan is, like, how you can, like, recall the vague details of something that happened, like, eight years ago. And you're like, do you remember when that, that time that – and and he'll be like, oh yeah, and he'll go into like the most minute detail. The the guy's memory is just off the charts. It is truly the most amazing memory with like regards to sports. He remembers everything down to like the finest little detail. It it I it boggles my mind on a daily basis. You need that around because your guy's banter when he he picks that stuff. I I just imagine he has like a a file cabinet next to him, yeah. but that's not, he just, he, that comes from him. I, I swear. It's like, he's got one of those in his head and it's like, it's gotta be some photographic thing. Like, um, you know, I think like one of the things that drives my wife nuts is like, I can't remember anything, but I can remember every single golf hole that I've ever played. Like, you know, it's like a weird thing, but he remembers like events like that. Like just like, and little, it, I mean, minutia, and it, it's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating the human mind how it operates. So, how was uh, how was the move in the in the recent? We, we've kind of shared some life experiences around the same time you and I. I think our kids are a couple months apart. Uh, I had no idea you were moving. I kind of fell out of my my podcast routine for a while, and then all of a sudden, Andy's calling in from California on a regular basis. So I'm like, wait, what did I miss? So, how was the move? You're a California man now. Yeah, the the move was uh, I mean, it was the move. I don't think anybody ever gets done moving and be like, and it was like, you know what, moving was great. Moving that was really a great experience. I I can't wait to do it again. But it, it's uh, it's nice. You know, it is uh, as you probably share with me, uh, I'm very very busy from um from really like 
March till till October ish. Um, like it's, it's extremely busy. I'm away from home a ton. And, um, you know, one of the things is that when I spend a ton of time at home and, and now we have a two year old, uh, you're probably approaching two here. Uh, when I am home, there's not in Chicago, there was nothing to do. Like, you know, it'd be like, oh, there's a ton of ice and it's like, oh, so I can, I can play with, with my daughter in the same room I played with her yesterday. Maybe we could, maybe we could chop things up in the basement even though it's really unfinished and an awful place just for a change of scenery but the that was like a big impetus of it was you know just being somewhere that 12 months a year we enjoyed being and and could do you know we we're both from the midwest and it's crazy to move away from family uh with a young child but one of the things we wanted was our kid to be able to do um to li- grow up being outdoors um and being outside and and so uh we're here for now i don't know how long we'll be here but uh it, it's uh you know it's it's been enjoyable to waking up and and you know not really looking at the weather ever has been <laughs> been one of the most most uh you know yeah i feel like any golfer is oh. like tied any golfer in the midwest northeast you know southeast really you're tied to the you're just stricken to your weather app <laughs> and out here, like I, I never look at it. I just never even like I, you know, I might look at it and be like, oh, what's it gonna be like, like in ten days? Like, see if something's coming. Like this weekend's supposed to be really hot here, so it's like, oh, we'll go to the pool, you know. Uh, I mean, these are the same climate related reasons that I moved my family to Ohio. You know, we just yeah, love exactly. we, we love the warmth. We love getting out there. Um, I'll I'll play I'll play devil's advocate with you for a second though on the weather app. I think, I mean, I at least for my friends that live in the warm weather destinations, they're never in a hurry to get to the golf course. And I think, therefore, they play less golf. Well, so what I mean is there's no, like, urgency. They don't, they just like, oh, well, if we don't play today, we'll just play tomorrow. Where it's like me, you know, this morning it was torrential, like, huge-ass thunderstorms, and it broke this afternoon. I'm like, I got to get out there. If I don't get out there, I got to work the next couple of days. I got to play this afternoon. So I'm like – urgently trying to get out there so i i think i get more rounds in than you guys is my oh i would agree i i think that there is there's less um there's more to do outside here too it, at least in california right like i live in an area that like on saturday mornings it's absolutely wild i had no clue about this like when we moved here but like I, I walk out and say I'm going to the grocery store to grab like something for breakfast or something. And I walk out and there's like an army of mountain bikers riding down the road. And I mean, it's wild. The mountain bike subculture, I did not. Oh, I've yeah. never. Oh, I mean, it. these guys like these people are riding around on like ten thousand dollar bikes. They make like golf clubs look cheap. Oh, man. and and I, I was like, I was like, I'm somewhat relieved that my mountain bike my bike didn't make it here because the bike thing that i bought didn't fit the car and i didn't test it before <laughs> you know just a disaster so the bike got left home when i drove across the country it was it was kind of heartbreaking but uh but at the same time you know it was uh it, it's fine like i would have been it, i would have been getting looks for my my like shitty high school bike being, uh, being you got out, a, yeah, a huffy out there with all the big boys. <laughs> I think it was a track. It was at least a track. Oh, okay. It wasn't a huffy. <laughs> yeah, Californians are crazy, man. I, I actually, a, a girl that helps us with some of our, our merch coordination. She uh, lives in San Diego, and she's in a running group. And I always just assume that, like, because it's like 150 people that get together to run. And she, she laid it on me this morning, actually, that it's a, it's a drinking running group. So literally, they'll go on a run with three stops. Sometimes it's a bar, other times it's a park, but they'll like run for five miles and then they get there and someone was responsible for setting up like some beers or like a- a- uh, Aperol spritz or something. And then they run oh. four more miles. I was like, this sounds, who came up with this stuff? Only in California do you people do these things. I, I, do you ever, did you ever at the end of like a long night in your younger years, just like run home if you were by yourself? Andy. All, that is all the time. Am I alone in this? Do you do this? Too? No, I used to do that all the time too. Dude, you were hit. Hitting... It was like, why would I walk? I might as well run as long as I have shoes that accommodate it. Like what? Why would I walk? I would book it. I, I, I specifically remember in college, 
uh, I'd get home. My roommates would see me. I'd be dripping sweat because our, our bars were probably like a good 10 minute run. And, and I just, uh, something about, you know, the shots at the bar made me invincible. You did. I think too. the other thing you get home you, you, the next morning, you feel better. Cause you got, you know, you, you, you started the process of, of, I, I always felt like it gave you a little leg up on the next day, how you feel the morning is the same thing. I used to play basketball on Saturday mornings and, yes. and we go to this, like, it was like an elementary gym with like bad circulation, but you could always tell like the day, the night, the, the mornings after big nights, like you just like, you're just dripping sweat. <laughs> like you're just like, it's just, and it's just like, you feel bad for the, for the person that has to guard you at that time. But you know, those, uh, those years are long past me now. Oh man. Uh, do you play any pickup basketball now? No, I'm terrified of injury. Uh, I I'm with you because of golf or children or what? <laughs> Just golf. Like, you know, like the idea of like, I had a buddy that, that ruptured his Achilles and he was like playing bath pick up hoops and he, he couldn't do anything for like a year. And it's like, well, like, how would I do my job if I ruptured my Achilles? Yeah. It'd be, you know, so it's just, it's a hazard of the occupation. It'd be, it's like why, you know, basketball players shouldn't, you know, or professional athletes shouldn't ride motorcycles, right? You know, limit, limit your capabilities of, of you not being able to perform your job well. Right. It's, it's, it's a good, good, good idea. Uh, I mean, are... could you imagine also raising a kid with like a, a torn ACL? Like, <laughs> you know, like it's saying to your wife, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have to get surgery and I can't walk for like, you know. I, I battle every day providing value to my wife. Uh, why, <laughs> why, would, why would I make it any worse? You know? I mean, like I miss, I miss it so much. Like literally the favorite way to get like a, a workout in was playing pickup hoops. Like I'll favorite, dude. I'll send you a a clip that one of my old basketball buddies sent me today from Instagram about a a uh, a wife or a girlfriend of of her uh, to explaining what her husband does with pickup basketball games, and it's kind of hilarious to hear her describe like it's these strange guys. None of them know each other, and they just show mm -hmm. up on the court, and someone says, "All right, I'm in. Who's in?" And then they pair up, and then if you win, you you keep the court, and there's never any fighting. And like, she, it's just hilarious how she describes it, but it, what I, and this is, I know you think very similarly about things sometimes is I couldn't help but think about golf. And I was like, I, that is an aspect of basketball that I absolutely loved the, the Saturday morning pickup game, or just walking out on the court and you just play, how could golf be a pickup game? Like, how would you do it? How many holes, but let's just say you showed up at a certain time at the golf course and you're like, all right, I'm in, who's in, who are we playing? What's going on? How, how, what do you think? You know, before uh, before the fried egg, I was I was a member. Well, in, in the beginning of it, I was a member at Calumet Country Club, which a lot of people will probably that listen to this probably know. Cal Club of Chicago. Is Try C, baby. Cal yeah. Club of Chicago. <laughs> um, so seeing better days, still battling though, Andy. I saw it recently. <laughs> it's still fighting, buddy. It's still fighting. They at the time they had this great. Uh, it, it was not a great program for the club because like they were kind of as they had they've been dire straits kind of financially but like they had an unbelievable young member deal and i remember a cdga great head uh, pro andrew stevens was there right yeah. your time yep yeah lorraine uh scodro uh told me who works for the cdga does all the tournaments she would you know i was playing tournament golf then she's like she said to me once like andy the fact that you haven't joined Calumet living in the city is absolutely crazy. You're costing yourself hundreds of dollars a year by playing, you know, banging around public courses. So anyways, I looked into it. Then we got a ton of young members that joined. Like it was, it was, I mean, we, I think at a time we had like 40 guys under four handicap. And one of the things that I brought from uh, Pepe Irwin, who used to be the director of golf at Schaumburg country or Schaumburg golf club used to have, uh, a thing he called the scratch game and it was awesome it was it was one of the coolest things it was like once or twice a week or once or twice a month and it was saturday morning he'd block off you know four tea times at schaumburg and the deal was bring 40 bucks cash and that all goes into pot 20 goes to low gross 20 goes to gross skins and he would get you know 16 to 20 of really high quality mid-am golfers there. 
and you'd play for money. And so I took that concept and brought it to Calumet and it was like a pickup game. Like you, they, we'd have the tee times blocked out and then it was, you know, it was Monday of the week and it's like, Hey, who wants to play Saturday morning? And you know, here are time slots. And then we just slot people in everybody play. Like you, we'd set it up. So people, new people would play with new people and all the money went into the pot. And then it's just paid out at that. Like, and it was a way, and it was really fun. It was, it was the most fun, a summer of playing golf that I had because like, you know, then all of a sudden around the club, you'd see a guy like that. You didn't know before that you played with and you be like, Oh, I'm going to play an afternoon nine. You want to play. And you, and it, what it spawned was a lot of like money games after. And it, that was, I probably the summer that I got significantly better at golf because I was playing like it, it just like in basket. Like if you play a lot of pickup basketball, yeah, you get better you know, it's right. So true. Yeah. No, it, it's like that, that, uh, competitive outlet. That's not it's, but it's fluid. You know, there's no, it sounds like you had some organization to it. I'd like a head to head, like build a course with just three whole loops and you sit on the patio and wait for the next team to come, come off. And then you take them on. Obviously it wouldn't yeah. be very time, time effective for the game of golf, but something like the that. Pre the premise of it too was cool. It was you, you, everybody hit cuffs, like no gimmies, like that it, it made every it, get, it just made everybody that played in it sharper, better golfers. We're 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 very big on on kind of match play as a component of the club. When you're just going out, if you're playing regular tee, some like at least have a match so there's something on the line. Mm -hmm. Like go golf with purpose is kind of how I phrase it. But we did uh, a similar concept this summer actually called the monthly medal, where it's just five to six tee times at it's at a different course, and it's all stroke and it's like our only real stroke play where you're hitting cups every time because even in a best ball you know you're picking up every other hole but i i actually really have grown a little bit more appreciation for the stroke stroke play as a competitive format just because it's the opportunity to hit cups and it's forcing people that you know might be a little nervy on some two three players you know roll it in finish it up well i mean the best way to get to vanquish the nerves on the two to three footers is to hit a lot of two and three footers that matter. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the thing you, I noticed the most is like when you're used to hitting them and you, you play the majority of your golf hitting cups, you're going to make a lot more of those when they matter. Um, it's where you get shaky is when you, you're not in the habit. It's kind of a, you know, I, I love match play. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of that too, but it's a, it's an interesting dichotomy, right? You can, especially when you're playing match play with friends, like nobody likes to see their friend miss like that tune it. Like it makes it a little awkward, right? <laughs> yeah. When you make somebody putt something and, and they miss sure. it, like, you know, there is like a little bit of a, a, a tense uh, a aspect of that. And that's the one nice thing about stroke play is if you're hitting it is like it removes the the you know the the fact that somebody has to make somebody putt something right yeah, that, that but, judgment call right yeah being in Scotland we I played matches all the time it, it's it, it was an interesting uh, dichotomy from um, America like you know I I'd say this to people is like I I don't play a lot of golf for myself I you know like I I'll be you know, I play with like really cool people and stuff, but like a lot of it's in the framework of like, I'm here for work and seeing a golf course. And there's a reason I'm here um, versus like me going out and playing nine holes at, at twilight, you know, by myself, because I want to go out and play golf like that. The, the different, you know, I play like a, a, a substantial amount of golf, but it's mostly in the vein of work. But what, you know, what ends up happening a lot of times is like, there's no stakes. Like I'm out, I'm just out there. I'm seeing the golf course. I'm hitting shots and you know, whatever happens. And what I find is like, you know, my plays, it's just like sloppy and it's not like, you know, I'm not like we're, I don't care, you know? So it's yeah. naturally sloppy. And uh, when we were in Scotland, everywhere we went, we always had a match. Like there was, it, it was like the host at, at the club, like versus the host in America, like the host of the club, and Scotland was like, what's the, what are the teams? What's the match we're playing? Like, it was like pre, it was, it was not a question yeah, no, of like, you know, yeah. we're playing a match and, and it's something that I really enjoyed because it actually made me like focus. And then by the end of the trip, like I was like, oh, I'm like still somewhat capable at playing golf at, at a reasonable level 
versus like most rounds I finish with and I'm like, oh, I just stink. And it's like, well, <laughs> if you don't actually apply yourself, you know, you're going, yeah. to, going to stink. So I think that's the thing is like having some sort of stakes every round you play, even if it's with it, with yourself is so important. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, like anyone listen knows what a proponent I am for match play, but I do think culturally over there, that idea of, again, golf with purpose, that there's something we're playing for here today and it might be a pound or it might be a drink or it might be nothing, but are knowing what the match is. I think it's interesting too, that they don't do games. You know how, like at most art clubs, Andy, a lot of people will just throw points, like, like go crazy, you know, games like Vegas games, like banker, like that's kind of become the default over there. I thought it was funny. I, I tried to do a Nassau with the guys, in the new golf club of St. Andrews, just a Nassau, just a back nine front. They looked at me like I had three heads. They're like, what? what, what no, this is the match. It's, it's the big, I'm the- out on Nassau's actually you done, done with Nassau's. Well, I just think it's just preposterous that you could like, with presses and all that bullshit, if I win the 18 hole match, I better win the match. I better win the whole yes. thing. If I win, if I win, if I beat you, I win. There shouldn't be <laughs> any sort of format where I can lose. <laughs> the when simplicity I beat of that statement is so good. If I beat you, I win. No, I, I, I hear you. It's I, the same with the way people well, play bags or core hole or whatever you talk about it with the exact number yeah i think this is like a golf take like where (laughs) oh you have to end exactly on 21 that is such a terrible rule like if i'm just dominating you if i am if i am kicking your ass there should be no means of recourse where you can you can then for some reason with some bullshit press that doesn't matter when you've already lost six and four you know press twice and and beat me on the last two holes when I don't really care because I've already beaten you like the same thing with bags. If you're, if you're getting your ass kicked, there shouldn't be anything about like ending up on 21 and I will fight to the grave about that, that rule and and bags or cornhole, whatever you talk about, whatever you call it. Yeah. Is we got Ohio listeners too, Andy, be polite. It's cornhole for them and bags. Oh, for... it's you guys, bags. here's, here's it's... the thing with bags though. You guys are in like a pocket of Illinois. That's only, you're the only baggers out there. Everybody else is cornhole. You go into Iowa and Nebraska, they're playing cornhole. You go up north Minnesota, they're playing cornhole. What happened in Illinois that you guys decided this? No, this thing is bags. It's a better name. Cornhole is like it's a gro- It's just like an absurd name. Like what? Why would it be called that? It's I, you're throwing back. Hey, hey, do you want to play throw uh, play cornhole or hey, do you want to go throw bags? Which one sounds? more fun you know i think I, I think cornhole could be a little bit more imaginative you never know maybe yeah. it's uh <laughs> it could be could be imaginative in a lot of bad ways that says a lot about what's going on in between the ears yeah. that's what i think well that's uh hey let's go throw bags like that that is uh, okay that's you guys so it was, game. it was because all the 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 good people of illinois the mormons probably had something to do with it you guys said nope we're gonna keep this clean we're gonna call it bags I yeah. get it. Well, so, yeah, uh, you brought up Scotland. American I, golf started in Illinois too. So, I, you know, I, <laughs> been right about a lot of things. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, I have a question for you about Scotland. Cause I don't know if you'll remember this, but I think it was that same, you and I hanging out at Pete's coffee, probably in like 2017, but you said, and I, I was shocked at, you know, architecture aficionado, Andy Johnson had not been to Scotland at the time, but I think you had, intentions of of going and you said to me that you were going to do it in a unique way or you had an idea or a theme about how you wanted to see scotland and i asked what it was and you said well you'll have to see i don't know if you remember that but it didn't happen because of covid so i never got to see and and you finally went right and i listened to your uh, recap pods at least the the first two from scotland which i loved uh we actually were over in may played uh similar courses to, to your guys lineup and I, uh, so I love that, that insight, but my question for you is, do you remember what your initial idea or theme was for seeing Scotland? Uh, yeah, it, we definitely did it way different than the initial idea. It was going to be, uh, it, I, I don't want to tell it cause I still might use that <laughs> idea. Come on, man. I, we can't, we can't just give out ideas. All right. Free. All know? right. Fine. This well, is, I... you never know, you know, it's like the, uh, but. 
but yeah, I, we, I felt like I was, I felt like I was McNulty trying to piece together your, uh, like what your theme might've been or what you like would do. And if it's, please tell me, it's not just pick a, pick a town and use that as your hub because Andy, no, I, I hate to no, tell no, you, no. I hate to tell you that's not rocket science, brother. No, it life changes. Like when I told you that I, I was, uh, I, I don't know if I was, I, I don't think I was married yet. I don't think I so. Mean, and uh, I think I was engaged. I was, uh, I did not have a kid. And uh, so the, the plan was like far, far different. Yeah. Now, like I, if you could start to think about that, then like you could probably start to put some pieces together about how you would do it. Right. Okay. When, yeah. when you when your life has no attachments versus when your life has, you know, things that that, you know, I mean that's that's I, I'm sure you feel the same way when when you have a kid that your life changes and and obviously like you, your ability to do um long term jaunts are are is significantly hindered and, and made more difficult because you know there's always a point in a trip where in it where you start thinking god i wish i was home no matter how much fun you're you're having because you know you you're, you're missing your kid and, and your wife and you're you know you're just being with your family yeah i think that's the emergence of the buddy trip makes so much more sense to me now of you know you can't take those uh those trips all that often well, yeah. for better or worse and you can't drag the family along i know you've tried that a little bit too and that that also gets dicey Oh, it's hard. I mean, it's just like, well, you just if you bring the family, it's like, oh, you know, you could bring your family. It's like, well, then I'm gone all day, and yeah. they're they're just like sitting in a, a random like Airbnb or hotel room, and uh, in a in an odd town, and it's just, you know, so it's it's hard because like if you're going with the family, you want to set aside a lot significant amount of time to be with them in that place, but then it 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 counteracts like your productivity in the place. So it's it's hard. It's a you know it's a uh, it's a dicey thing. Like it's it's, it's the balance, like anything, right? Because like right. if you bring your family somewhere, they it's like a vacation for them, but it's a work trip for you, right? And that and that that push and pull can be can be hard to uh, navigate. So so back to Scotland. Uh, what? And again, I recommend you know. And for Andy's takes on things and, and all this stuff, you can go to the fried egg podcast. You can go to the shotgun start. You can go to friday.com. We'll get to all that. But um, I did want to ask you what surprised you about Scotland, you know, as golfers, I think we hyped this up in our head. We have all these expectations for you. Was there a surprise that you were, weren't anticipating? Um, you know, I think they're maybe not surprising. Uh, just certain things made a, a big impression on on me um you know one of the things i think like people have blown up to me like oh i can't believe you've never been to scotland like you haven't seen the greatest architecture in the world like blah 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 and it, like people have said this to me like for six years and and to be completely honest like i think like i think the best architecture in america is significantly better than the best architecture in scotland um now on the flip side the architecture in scotland is very very good but the playing conditions are so extraordinary ex exorbitantly better than them in america that the architecture plays better in scotland mm. so yeah if that makes sense right right so the architecture shines more in scotland but you know, for the most part, like a lot of Scottish architectures is fairly rudimentary. Like it, it's like they kind of figure it out, laid it out, and it's amateur. Like, you know, like some of the stuff that's done in America, especially in the golden age or the modern stuff now, is at a whole different level of of sophistication and and thought out. Like, you know, there there are so with that, like I don't think the architecture is better. I think the architecture is presented better and plays better. So the that was something that like I kind of like I felt like so people were like talking down to me because I hadn't seen this and that. And like, I think there's a certain aspect of that. But at the same time, I can say in America, like I've seen a shitload of stuff that other people haven't seen because I've spent a lot of time going and seeing places that a lot of people haven't heard of, you know, Um and I think like that was one thing that made an impression on me and will last with me is like 
let's not like get the two twisted like the presentation and the maintenance and the firmness of the ideal conditions for golf make scottish architecture better than american architecture but the architecture itself isn't necessarily better i think that makes a, a ton of sense and i i remember you saying on your your recap pods about that that rudimentary feel it was it was a thought i've been circling around ever since i was a kid and i couldn't really nail it but it was that it kind of goes a little bit cultural over there too where everything's just kind of get on with it and and a lot of the great uh, courses that people revere over there just are a bit simpler. And, and I think you could go all the way to, you know, old Tom and the argument about, was he a genius or was he just kind of seeing the features and saying, put the T here and, and that's hit over that thing. And there's the green and it just lays out, you know, that's where our shorter grass is going to be. And I, I don't know. I mean, is he a little bit of both? Maybe what's your thought on, it doesn't make it any, I think it's like by using the word rudimentary, it's not, any less good. We're not saying it's less good. No. It's just, it might have been less thoughtful. It might have, have been a bit more straightforward because they were blessed with such great ground to play golf on. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And I think like the ground, it, it also like, so the, the back part of that is like, you know, it shows that like natural features are the best features, right? When, you know, just using the natural ground and, and the less manufactured, golf is generally the golf that i enjoy more people could argue like they're i i this is just my taste i say this a ton now because i think that people struggle with like this is just the way i see it and and it's you know me and you could go to a restaurant and have completely different viewpoints on the restaurant and nobody's you know calling you you know absurd you know you know, saying you're doing something for like, it's just the different way we feel about the way we like our food. Hey man, I don't like shrimp. I just don't like shrimp. I'm sorry. So, you know, like it's the same thing with golf courses. Like it's, it's not just because I have a strong opinion on something doesn't mean I'm, I'm looking for clicks or something, but like, I think the, the, the thing about, uh, the, it's just the natural contours, like the old course is a perfect example of that. Right. Like, you could try and build those like those features that uh, two and three and sixteen and and uh, and but like those those features, it's just like sand the way it was blown there, and they threw grass on it, like grass grew on it, like and then they started mowing it down, like it's just like just like that's the way it was, and and to a certain extent, like you start to think about like your favorite holes anywhere, a lot of them for the most part are going to be holes that are just natural holes because the thing about natural golf and and when you're using landforms that were shaped by you know the elements in nature is that you can't actually replicate them right they're one of ones because you know you can you can replicate and i think this is an interesting thing with like the lido and recreating the lido right that was a manufactured golf course right and we're getting to the point where we can replicate down to the the thing. But like at the same time, you can never replicate the turf. You can never replicate the wind that was on. Like it's not on the Long Island. So it is the Lido. And I'm, I, I can't wait to go see it because you're going to see the architecture. But it's missing so many of the elements of it. Right? right. And I think that's the thing about golf there is that all of those golf co- courses and holes, for the most part, with the older courses are one of ones. Because they are, you know, they are like they're they were derived by people that hadn't seen other stuff like, you know, there's like this, um, you know, being naive, right, to certain things can be a huge benefit and and not knowing, you know, the way like sometimes there are people's say. first it's the same thing with musicians, right? So many times people's first albums are their best albums because, you know, they they're they're authentic and they're 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 them right and with these golf courses over there is like not being able to move dirt like creates super unique holes that like otherwise would be changed and benched or you know softened by you know by by architects and i think one of the things with scotland too is like it a lot of the features are smaller right and it shows like they're way more walkable they're and like you don't need huge gigantic features for really great golf 
That was the that was the other thing is like when you see a picture of some of the great courses in Scotland, you always look at it and it's like, I don't know what's so special about that place. It doesn't look that great. But then you get on it and it's like, well, like I think the reality is, is that smaller, smaller movement is better for like every especially with, for with everyday golf. Yeah, with yeah. the appropriate land though too, and the way it plays, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like everybody wants the dramatics. And I think like if you're in the business model of of a resort golf, say like one time destination golf, like where people are going to play, you want dramatic big features because then people will be like, you won't believe this. But if you're in the market for everyday golf, if you're talking municipal golf or you're talking a club golf, like the best features are actually much smaller. Like yeah. I think the 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 less like I I think about this with like Sand Hills and Wild Horse. Um, which like Sand Hills, obviously like one of the most spectacular places in the, in the world for golf. It's really big. It's brawny. Like you walk it and you feel it. Like you feel like it's and you're, you're having to hit these heroic shots up over these big ridges. And you think like, this is such thrilling golf, but, and that's a perfect golf for a destination golf club where all of your members are coming from out of town and they're coming a couple times a year. Go down the road to Wild Horse, which is like a seventy dollar uh public golf course or seventy or less, and you've got much smaller features. They're you know, it's not the gigantic sand dunes, it's at the start of the sand dunes. And I would say this I would play if you know, if I was in that area, I'd play Wild Horse more than I'd play Sand Hills. Wow. I'm not saying Wild Horse is a better golf course than Sand Hills, but for everyday play, like if I was going to like if I was going to play one course every day, I'd probably pick Wild Horse because it's smaller. Like I could it's easier to get yeah. around. It's like it's it's more manageable. It's it's just like it doesn't take like I'm not going to feel it the rest of the day if I go carry my bag for 18 holes, right? If that makes sense. Like yeah. I'm not saying Wild Horse is a better golf course than Sand Hills. I'm saying, you know, there are different buckets. There's different ways to talk about golf courses. And for everyday golf, I would argue that Wild Horse is better than Sand Hills. That's, uh, and wow. this is the problem with these stupid lists. It's just like, <laughs> it's the silliness of it. It's like, well, what are we talking about? Like, you could, you could make arguments. Like, you could say, hey, I don't know if you've ever listened to the Thai podcast. They do like these match plays between. No courses henry shimp and walker simus they're good guys cool. uh it's a good good show um but they do these match plays and like they did one between old town and wilshire and i texted him i texted henry afterwards i was like i can't believe that was so close i mean old town's such a better course than wilshire and, he, and it's like so if you do 18 holes match play like one versus one you could you could come yeah. up with like you could have crazy scenarios where a certain course beats like a great course just because of the way they lay out if you do, how would you split 10 rounds? If you you might want to play the more fun course more than another course. But if you're looking at it like architecturally, you might say the other course is better. But like, really, we're getting at the point of like what, you know, everybody's taste is different. Right. And what are, we, what are like, we trying to evaluate? What is it that we're, we're trying to, to, to actually rank? And, and they're, yeah. they're totally different things. Of course, that you're playing every day versus a course that, and I, I actually, I've, I've taken some of your like thoughts and rankings for some of our trips that we've made to ask people what their favorite course was. We stopped doing that. And we started saying, oh, you got 10 rounds, split them up. I love how, how you've always done that on the pod. And then the other one is you got one round left to play in your life. Whereas, exactly. You know, like think, so, cause th those are two very different propositions. Yeah. So yeah. Like sand Hills, for example, if it was one round, Versus why? Oh, I'm going to Sand Hills. Like, there's no question in my mind. Right. I'm going there. Like, and that's the thing about it and why it's so silly that we come up with these, that, that you know, that there are these lists and there's like the definitive because courses have, I like to think of them a little bit more of like superlatives, right? You know, and like, I don't want to go play. A good example too is like, like uh, Oakland Hills South, like, tremendous golf course i would not want to play that every day it's just beats the shit out of you right, right. like you know like i sometimes want to mercy, feel good mercy. about my golf game like right like yeah you know i want to go and 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 then at the same time like you know it's it just so i think that's like the thing that 
And, and what happens because of these lists? And this is why, bringing this back to Scotland, why, you know, these lists are so detrimental to people's enjoyment of a trip in Scotland is because they see the list and they go, okay, we got to go play all these on the list. And what happens is that a lot of them get skipped. Like the, the places that I think about the most get skipped. Like obviously North Berwick and the old course and Beerfield were, were great. But like, I loved our night out at Dunbar and I, I, I couldn't think about not playing Dunbar because we were getting in a car and driving to Carnoustie, right? Like, yeah. you know, like it, it, you know, the, a, the thing is, is like, it's going to reduce the amount of time that you're, you're in a car most, which is the worst part of any golf trip without <laughs> a doubt. And B you're going to miss all these other courses that, you know, they might not be the greatest golf course in the world, but in a given scenario, if it's the back half of here's the thing is like, if it's the back half of a 36 hole day, certain places like Dunbar that don't have a ton of elevation are a lot better than going and getting your ass kicked at like, you know, at somewhere that you had to do, you know, like the exhaustion level and in, in certain things, are, you know, that that's, yeah. that's the aspect is like in certain situations, certain courses are better than others. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I got hey, Ely. You got to dr drop a little Ely on us. I know that that was really special. It, it, talk about like our, our ranking system where we said split 10 rounds. I think Ely was actually right with the old course. It might outpace the old course in a group of like 24. What, uh, what stuck with you from that place? Um, I, you know, it was like a magical night. It was, it was just like, it was one of those. You were coming off food you were poisoning. Chasing the I, sun. I, remember, I heard that. Yeah. Whenever you're chasing the sun. Right. And I mean, we were playing till dark. We couldn't see where the 18th tee shots went. Bacon like drove the green shade. Bacon drove the green. I mine, I don't know where it went. <laughs> like we never found it. It was, a, it was a tight match too. It was kind of a bummer. <laughs> and, uh, and Did you check like, the car we, park. Did you check the car park? I think it's, Comes I don't play. think I could get there. I don't think I could get there because I was playing persimmon. Um, I think I hit it into the into the junk. I, yeah. I, you know, I don't think I rose to the occasion. I think I I faltered and hit it into the junk. But um, but I think like just the 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 thing that'll stick with me there is just like, I mean, the first hole, the audacity. It kind of reminded me of Eagle Springs. I was going to say, it's one of our shared favorites. Eagle Springs, that first hole. I, as soon as I walked up at Ely, I go, oh my God, this is it. This is where that yeah. Irish bastard had to have played when he built that thing in Eagle, Wisconsin. Yeah. I mean, like the idea of just like hitting over this huge hill. The thing that I like about that hole too is like you hit over the hill and you th you're expecting the green to be like right there. It's like 200 yeah. yards further. Yes, it's like so far. I, I was like, holy shit! It was I into hit, the wind the day we played it too. Yeah, I I hit three wood, not knowing. You know, we were rushing to the tee, and I just assumed I was like, well, I mean, it's an old course. I'll just hit. It. And I had like a like a three iron in the green. Yeah, yeah. It, so that and then obviously, I think the the way it's like a journey, and uh, I love the way. I mean, I think like the. The thing that gets lost there is like four and five were probably two of my favorite holes, but then you come to six and that reveal of the ocean is unbelievable. And what I like about it is like <clears throat> Danny Rappaport was in the group ahead of us and he yelled over from seven, which plays back away from the sea. He yelled like, I want to go back there. And I think that's a really cool aspect of the way that golf course is routed where it takes you to the, where you're going to go eventually. And all you can think about is like, God, those holes look awesome. And and you see like the 10th hole, which is that amazing short par four that you like hit at a rock. And then the greens down at the dip at, on the edge of the coast, you see that hole, you see the par four. Uh, I think it's what 12 and 13 to play along the coast. Like 13 is the one that James Braid says the best hole in the British yeah. Isles. Um, you see those holes. But then he takes you away and you kind of play back towards the town. And what I love, I love those routings that kind of jog you between portions. Um, so it kind of takes you to a spot, but then it it teases you, right? It, it's like, um, and then it brings you away from it, but you know you're going back there. 
Yeah. And my favorite part of the whole journey is that, you know, you play those spectacular holes, uh, really 9, 10, 11, 13, 14 plays right away and you think you're heading home and then 15 brings you right back. And that hole is awesome. But that huge mound and it kicks down. And if you hit it right in the right spot, it'll feed it right yeah. to the green. If you don't, it'll, if you're just a little short, it'll roll to the right, short right of the green, which isn't a great spot. Or mine like didn't climb up all the way to the hill, top of the hill. It rolled all the way back down. Yeah. And I had like a, I had like 160 yards in. So it's like that, that hole. And it brings you right back okay. to that area that you had this like awesome, ex- like there, like a surreal experience there like on that, on that sea. And it brings you back there one last time before you head home. Yeah. That, and if you have, imagine that being your everyday club and you seeing, you know, the 40 other people that you play against in that sequence of holes that they're playing yeah. and, and knowing that the wind, maybe the wind changed slightly from when you played it. it I, I just love the uh, connectivity of that place. Um, it's, it's way up there on my on my list for like places I want to play every day. It's just it's exactly, nice. and th- this is a perfect example of like the the what the discussion we just had. Is Ely better than Muirfield? Is Ely better than the old course? I don't think so. Like from a pure, would yeah. I rather play Ely every day than the old course? Then uh, the old course I think is one of those rare like every yeah. day. I, uh, that place would be amazing to play every day. But would I rather play Ely or Mirfield every day? I'd rather play Ely. Like Mirfield is just going to punch you in the face all day, you yeah. know. And like I need a break from that. I, 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 you know, I'm not. Maybe some people will say, "Oh, he's soft. Like he doesn't like hard golf." But like, I love hard golf. I, you know, I, I, I have no problem. Like. I'm going to fare pretty well. If you make a golf course really hard, that's like that. That's something that I enjoy. I hit the ball very straight. Like, I think, you know, I think I remember then, you and but, I talking about the places that like the CDGA qualifiers, we played at the best were the places that had no architecture bones whatsoever. Oh <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like they're just like the worst. They're so the golf blah. courses that offend me the most are the, are the ones that I play the best at because it becomes like who can hit the ball straight and far, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it, 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 so I think like the the thing about about it like Muirfield's awesome. It's an awesome awesome course and you should not you should do everything in your power to play Muirfield. Right. But it, in terms of like where I would want to play more I'd rather play Ely more than Muirfield because you know I I think it would just wear on me. Let me ask you this question because I know you, you we were coming up on time and I wanted to ask you about uh template holes and here's why. When I, when the Friday was getting started and I, I used to book, bookmark your template holes. Cause I'd send it to my buddies that were, you know, either golfers getting back into it from high school, uh, or, or new guys like that played football and baseball growing up. And I was trying to like, you know, they would go to the, the worst golf courses where they wanted to play most of the time. So I was trying to like educate my group of friends. A lot of them became new club members. Love you guys. If you're listening, but, uh, it was just like, and this is one of the things I love about the fried egg. And I think it's still very evident in your guys' mission today is making, you know, great architecture accessible through good content and, and telling the story as you guys do. Um, so, so, you know, I thought those templates was such a cool way. Cause I wasn't like, I was into golf course architecture. I, I thought about it. I definitely would, you know, check out golf club Atlas every once in a while, but I wasn't like able to explain it. And what I loved about template holes was it gave this opportunity to explain why a hole is great and share it with somebody else and say, Hey, people thought this template's great and they reproduce it at all these other places. What was your experience like seeing template holes? I mean, you, you, you wrote all those pages all those years ago about them. And now you got to, to play a lot of them for the first time, particularly North Barrick, where there's some key ones. Was it, what were you, what, what was going through your head as you were having that experience? Well, the, the North Barrick Redan, I never understood the photos. Like I never could get, I never saw a photo that actually explained the whole, like I couldn't yeah. get what was going on with the bunkers. Like, I, uh, I, you know, uh, in front or all, all over in, yeah, the in giant front, one to the front, back, right? The, the ones in front, like okay. I couldn't get, I didn't understand. I was like, are those pushed up against the green? Like it, it doesn't look like it orients. And then when you, you I, I think I was flying the drone. And I flew like I had never seen like a low fly drone flyover. And I just I'm flying over it really low. And I'm like, oh, 
I get it now. <laughs> like it is. You just it's needed just a proper like those, drone pilot to do it the, for you. Those, yeah, but those bunkers are just raised up, so you can't. It, it obscures the horizon line, and yeah, it, it, you know, like it was really cool seeing the Redan. I, I mean, I think the old course was the probably the place where you see, you know, you, it it makes the most sense. Like back, um, it, you know, some holes. Uh, like some greens, especially, and and just like the whole, yeah, I guess the concept of of like the shared fairways, shared greens. Um, you know, like one of the one of the greens out there, the twelfth green at 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 St Andrews, the old course, is like really similar to the eighth green at, at Common Ground. That was like mm-hmm. neat. Like I went and played co- Common Ground again in Colorado and Denver. Um, and after, and I was like, oh. That that's just like the the twelfth green in St Andrews, and it's like stuff like that. And, and you like then you are like oh, I think Brian Schneider built that green. Who who's like a, obviously loves St Andrews, and I think um, I mean I think the biggest takeaway was like just the the way, and this isn't a new takeaway. The 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 how they're just like part of the fabric of the towns, and all the courses and the clubs have like a different identity and different culture and it really centers around the town right and like one is evident of like dunbar dunbar is like a much more blue blue collar town than north barrack and and the feel around the club is is so much different right like Mm -hmm. in in the golf course like those people are really proud of their golf course and they should be but they don't get the love um in in it's kind of like you know if you use your city of cleveland right the cleveland people are super um you know, they, they're super passionate about their town and, and, you know, but they, sometimes, you know, the town gets a little like, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's Cleveland. Right. But like Dunbar, like that golf course is, it, it, if it was, you know, the sad, it's like, if it was in North Bear, I could be charging twice the green fee and in, in every, it'd be on everybody's itinerary, but people won't drive the 20 extra minutes down the road to go see a golf course that has, you know, 14 holes on, on the sea. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, man, I mean, culturally that, that, that's what started new club, you know, straight was that experience. I'm just seeing how culturally golf exists over there and opening my eyes that the, the golf I grew up with is only, you know, a portion of what it can be. Uh, what do you think? I mean, is it courses that need to change first? Is it the way that our, our club structure changes first? If you, you know, I had to be a golf czar for a second and just, you know, bear with me for this idea, but like the U S golf scene, I mean, what, what would you want to see happen first for, for us to get, cause I think everyone that goes over there kind of agrees like, man, this is better. It, 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 it's not just the land. I don't think, I think it is a lot of this cultural stuff that we're talking about. Like, where do you think that starts or what's the, the first thing we, we would need in the U S uh, I think a lot of clubs need to realize how how beneficial it would be to open your doors occasionally. I mean, there's a lot of inventory, and I I hate say, telling somebody how to run their business, right? Like that that's not really my place to say that, but like I think losing some of the exclusivity, and I think that's the the biggest hindrance is like. And that's where I just I don't have a lot of um, faith in it changing. Is like I think Americans like their private things, and and uh, it's a it's a it's a show class. And over there, it's so much more about sharing what what they have with people versus like being like much more like I have this, you don't, and you know we don't get to coexist. Um, I think that's. A, a big part that's obviously like the elephant in the room, right? Is, is the idea. Well, I can't more American clubs operate the way Pasa Tiempo operates, right? Um, where they have public access every day. It's a private club. They have member times, they have public times, right? And, and, and for, for members of Pasta Tiempo, you know, you're never going to be assessed, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know what your dues are and it, it's a pretty nice, set up and it's a very sought after membership in Northern California for that reason. Just like a lot of places are sought after. Like, you know, did you say Northern California? Are... Sorry. Did you say Northern California? Got me, got me <laughs> at my bed. People have been telling me. I Andy, I thought you lived in the enough. central California. 
it's, it's, I, you know, everybody else calls it that. And I just, I get <laughs> tripped up sometimes, but anyways, the, um, I mean, like simple things, like as, as silly as it sounds, like a simple thing of like, I'm in Muirfield, the most like exclusive, the the most like, you know, high, uh, high society club in, in, in Scotland. And there's, there's dogs on Saturday morning. Yeah. That's why it, like what, I mean, like just little things like that. Like, why can't I? keep my dog on a leash and play golf like that yeah that to me so it's like little things like that would make incremental and and you know by by saying your dog can't come you're actually discouraging people to play golf which to me is so i feel like america does its best to discourage people from playing golf rather than encourage <laughs> if i can go kill two birds with one stone and take my dog for a walk and play golf I'm more likely to play golf and that's what we should be, you know, and I think a lot of cl the club model, the best club members are people that pay their dues and come like three times a year. Right. And bring guests the three times a year they come. How, how bad is that model? Like where it's, there's, that's what's success, right. Is not using the asset. It's wild. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, that could be a, a whole pot in itself. Well, I, uh, no, you got some other stuff to go to. I want to ask here one last question. Just looking at golf course architects, um, you're a student in the space. What are uh, this was submitted by uh, I think a, a mutual friend of ours, one of our our uh, ambassador members, Patrick McSpadden, wants to know who three names of up and coming architects that people may not know. Oh God, I mean this is like the this is the worst question to ask somebody. I know. You know? I, I I should it's we should just end it on a high note. You're, you're gonna alienate <laughs> do you want me, me, well, do you want me to ask you about live in the PGA tour? We could do that. We could do that instead. I mean, I I think this is we're at an impasse right now with with golf architecture where we're gonna. It's hard to say who's an up and comer because very few have had a chance to build a golf course, and I think like to be perfectly frank, restoration work is not hard. It's easy as, as long as you like do the, the work, the historical, and I'm not going to put, I don't want to poo poo like the historical work. The historical work is hard. It's amazing how many people screw up like, and don't put back what was there. Historical uh, restoration work is not rocket science. Building a golf course is hard. And we have a bunch of young people that like are, you know, to be frankly, like we haven't ever seen a Jim Urbina solo design. We haven't seen, you know, like we haven't seen a Tyler Ray solo design, really. I think he's got something going on. Um, but like a solo design is a lot different than restoring golf, like routing, figuring out how to take a blank canvas and figuring out how to build a golf course is a whole lot different. And everybody's like, oh, he's a great golf architect. How can somebody be a great golf architect if they haven't like built a few great golf courses? And I think this is like the same thing that's happened. You know, if you look at the history of golf, you know, like it, it, just because somebody builds one great golf course doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a great golf architect. Like David Kidd's been very open that he built some bad golf courses after he built one good golf course. And the way the cycle of golf architecture works is like you build one hit golf course and you're going to get an influx of jobs. And those jobs are going to come and sign on before we've ever seen you build another golf course. So to me, we're so quick to, oh, he's a great golf architect. Like if, if all they've done is restoration work, put stuff back. And I do not mean, I do not want this to sound condescending or demeaning. And a lot of the reason that these guys have been doing exclusively golf, uh, restoration work is because, because there aren't a lot of jobs and all the jobs get gobbled up by a few people. So now we're at the state where, you know, and we'll see how it, what happens with the economy and where it goes, but we're at the state where a lot of these, these architects are getting their first shot. You know, we're going to see Keith Reb and Riley Johns get to renovate and redo the, the course down in world woods, right? We're going to get to see Kyle Franz build some new golf. We're going to get to see Tyler Ray build, you know, do some substantial projects. We're going to get to see, uh, Jaeger Kovic do more and more work. That's when we can make a decision. You know, we're going to see King Collins's next three or four courses, right? Like 
it's hard to say like who's the next up and comer when none of them have really built solo work. That's I mean that's kind of the answer I think. <laughs> it's a great answer because it's it just gets me excited for all this stuff and it just reminded me Andy that I think I don't know what your personal opinion is but like our golden age or whatever you want to call what time we're living in man all I know is there's a lot of golf courses that I'm really excited to go play and uh I just feel like you've been at the heart of this for a while now and I got to imagine and you're a humble dude so you're not going to take this I'm sure but I, I the fried egg I think has had a ton to do with the knowledge that's out there on what what are we really after? What is really good, compelling golf, you know? And, and I just, I don't know. It all just feels like the content's there. The courses are being built. All the names you just listed are building projects. They're, they're back to work. Um, there needs to be more maybe, but I, I just, I just feel like maybe we're not in the golden age. Maybe we're coming up on it, but, uh, what are your thoughts? Is this the time? Do you feel that too? Or do you think it, it's a bit overstated? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're definitely in an era. Um, I, I I think the key is how long is it going to last, right? If it's if it's you know a ten year, twenty year window, like you think about the golden age was nineteen oh eight to really like nineteen thirty. These projects take so long, yeah. And the the other thing is like we don't have the land we used to have, right? Yeah. So. Like there can't really be like there. there's, and, and we, we built a lot of courses where they probably shouldn't be. <laughs> well, I mean, like that's going to be a big part of this next era is like what happens to all the seventies and eighties courses. I I mean, like an interesting projects like Conway Farms is redoing their project, their golf course. Right. And, and, you know, they did the front nine. It's substantially better, but like, how do you, you can't solve some of the problems without like a full reboot. Right. And what do all these courses do? Like Conway Farms is their front nine is way better than it was, but you know, there's still some clunky aspects of it. Right. And, you know, it, it's hard for a club to fully reboot. And I think, you know, for and every club it's different, but I think they made the right decision with how they're going about it. Right. You know, um, but like, you know, that's that it's, it's a new era for sure. Um, welcome to the new age, as uh, Nick Faldo would say. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be part renovation. It's going to be a lot of destination golf. I think like the destination golf market's hot, and I don't necessarily like people are say how many destination courses can there be. I think there can be a lot of destination golf courses, as evidenced by the success of 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 destination golf, right? Um, you know, you, you just have to get, the key is, is do you get people back a second time? Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, so, the, the golf that I don't know, we'll, we'll have you back on. And one thing I want to talk about is, is that local golf. Cause I, as much as destination golf is, is continuing to show that trend and, and adding to, you know, all of our lists, I, I want to see our, our local community golf courses get to the point, um, that we talked about overseas and everything. And I think that's, I'm not seeing the progress there as much as, as elsewhere. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but they're not, none of them are good. I think we can, we should be focusing a bit more of golf industry resources on, on those local courses. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, uh, this was fun. Thanks man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got through the whole thing. I I avoided live and PGA. If you want some great live golf banter of PGA versus the whole shebang, check out the Shotgun Start. I feel like those guys do a great job covering the program. Uh, where else can our folks find you, Andy? What? Um, I guess yeah, Twitter. <laughs> He's around. Uh, He's on some yeah. some platforms. Are you on TikTok yet? Is Josie on no, TikTok? No, I, I need that? to get on it. I yeah. gotta just. That's that's we're way behind the times now, man. That ship is sailed. Like, uh, need one more place to have go distract myself. And then and then let's play some golf. I want to play some golf. Yeah, Friday events. I, I I feel I haven't made one in a while. I want to get back out. Um, you got any of those coming up that our folks should yeah, know about? We got we got one in uh in Georgia, the field. One oh. of the, you, you like that spot too? Oh yeah, man. You're going back yeah. to uh, the. We're yeah. doing. It's gonna be a different one. It's gonna be a different uh feel. We're doing it all around college football, so it's gonna be like 
a Saturday afternoon hang out with barbecue or a pig roast and and we're doing Friday and Saturday morning golf and then just uh, kind of chill on Saturday afternoon low key um kind of supposed to be a little bit more casual and and laid back and I think it fits that place well well we got we got a bunch of Atlanta members I hope that are tuning in I'll go down to the field we're always trying to get people down there Ashley Young Mike Young those are great dudes uh awesome Best awesome dudes. It just it actually is trying to create an environment down there to hang to. And, and, uh, so go down, hit up Friday event. Um, Andy, good catching up with you, man. Thanks for the chat. We'll be, uh, we'll be seeing you soon. All right. See ya.